Welcome, welcome once again to another series. And uh, we are glad that uh, the Lord has been able to uh, give us uh, an opportunity to be able to share in his word. And uh, I thank the Gospel Sound as uh, ministry and uh, the host of the series, The Last Generation, Brother Zadok, although he's experiencing some uh, electrical uh, problems, electricity problem. But uh, then uh, uh, I want to welcome us uh, so that uh, we may be able to study the word of God. And um, this is a, a five part series on the issue of uh, the last uh, generation. And uh, there, there are many issues at stake. And as we study the word of God, we shall be able to understand why we have to present such a series in such a time that you are living in. But before we go fully into the word of God, I'd like us to pray. And then we see what the Bible says. We look at the synopsis of uh, this series, The Last Generation. Shall we uh, pray? Our Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for this time that you have given us to study your word. And Lord, I want to pray that uh, you may speak through me and uh, you are children may be benefited with the things that we are going to study. Give us a clarity of thoughts, clarity of mind, that we may only speak what heavens will want us to speak. And above all, Lord, that uh, it may not be information, but uh, it may be an experience that will draw us closer to thee. In the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, and so uh, I want to thank the Lord because uh, uh, of being given this opportunity to be able to uh, share in the word of God. And uh, we are looking at uh, the last generation. Uh, this is just a synopsis of uh, what we shall be sharing on this series. And uh, the issue of the last generation actually is uh, something that uh, finds it is uh, uh, origin in uh, ML Andreasen uh, article or a booklet called the Sanctuary Service. That is chapter 21, which speaks about the last generation. Although I just want to go through the Bible, but uh, I like to uh, just bring out this, that uh, this is something that was coined by ML Andreasen. And uh, it is in his book, The Sanctuary. This is page 108. In this chapter, Emil Andreasen says the final demonstration of what the gospel can do in and for humanity is still in the future. Christ showed the way. He took a human body and in that body demonstrated the power of God. Men are to follow his example and prove that what God did in Christ, he can do in every human being who submits to him. The world is awaiting this demonstration in Romans 8, 19. When it has been accomplished, the end will come. God will have fulfilled his plan. He will have shown himself true and certain a liar. His government will stand vindicated. And um, when you go a little bit further on uh, page, um, on, uh, page uh, 109, I think, he speaks about uh, the last year of the conflict brings the final test, but this only proves to angels and to the world that nothing that the evil one can do will shake God's chosen uh, one. And so uh, Emil Andreasson actually brought out this uh, topic in a way that um, the final generation is the generation that will be living under the third angel's message and more so just the last part of it and not the beginning of it. We know that uh, the third angel's message started back in uh, 1848 when the sealing message was uh, brought into view after the Day of Atonement started. But he says that uh, that final generation is the generation that lives 
in the time when the uh, the church comes in contact with the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and so there's that progression from the image of the beast and in the previous presentations we have seen that the image of the beast is the testing point of uh, the children of god and what is the image of the beast the image of the beast is the agitations of uh, the sunday laws when um, the apostate protestantism is uh, pushing the government to enact laws that uh, will interfere with the freedom of uh, speech and uh, liberty of conscience and then it is followed with the mark of the beast where actually now the uh, Sunday law is enforced. The issues at stake with the, 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 the topic of the last generation is actually vindicating the name of God and standing in the, uh, in the time of trouble with a protector but without a mediator because the work of the sanctuary could have been finished and then the people go through the last uh, seven uh, uh, plagues. But just prior to that, there is the image, the test in the image of the beast and the test in the mark of the beast, where actually this last generation has to prove that um, there are a people who can be used for the loud cry. And so uh, essentially what you are talking about is victor over sin. And uh, when we are talking about Victor over sin, some many things have uh, reason about uh, Victor over sin. When we talk about perfection, people start asking which kind of perfection, which kind of holiness are we talking about? And uh, there are many things that are brought in and many semantics. Uh, is it absolute perfection uh, and so on? But perfection is perfection. And that is when I'll go to the Bible. And uh, uh, in this synopsis, just look at what Bible the Bible says that uh, about uh, victory over sin. In the book of uh, Matthew, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 48, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, we are told, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Now, what kind of perfection is that, if you may ask? We cannot define perfection. Uh, we cannot define the perfection of God. And so just we live as the Bible says that be perfect as your Father in heaven, which uh, is perfect. God cannot call the last generation uh, to be something that he cannot be or to be something that his son has not demonstrated when he was on this world, that in this humanity and depending on the power of God and submitting his will to the father, the son was able to uh, uh, have victory over sin and leave us an, an example. In fact, uh, uh, to the last generation, I want us to see this link between how Jesus lived and the generation that shall be living in the end time. In the book of uh, First Peter, in the book of uh, uh, First Peter, chapter two, verses twenty-one, we are told: For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For ye were she as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of uh, your souls. And so we are told that in the mouth of Jesus Christ, there was found no guile. And the last generation have to perfect the righteousness of God. And why is this generation so important? Because it is the generation that enters the most holy, faith, most holy by faith and doesn't come out, but lives there by faith being sustained by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, being able to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. 
And what is this faith of Jesus Christ? The faith of Jesus Christ is victory over uh, sin. The faith of uh, uh, the faith of Jesus Christ is uh, victory over sin. This is demonstrated uh, in the book of First John. Uh, this is demonstrated in the book of uh, First John, chapter five, verses four. First John, chapter five, verses four says, "For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith." And so we find that uh, the final generation have by faith to overcome the world and have victory over the world and the things that are in the world. And uh, when we are talking about having the faith of Jesus Christ, and it is the faith that takes us into the most holy place and sustains us there and makes us live there in the presence of uh, a holy God, a holy people. And so the final, gener uh, um, the final generation have to demonstrate what actually Christ has done to them. And looking at that chapter 21 of uh, Emil Andreasen about the last generation, talking about that this is the generation that comes in compact with the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. When you go back to the Bible and uh, look at um, this instance, in the book of Revelation, chapter six, verses 17, there is a question that is posed when John sees the sixth seal being opened and looking at the issues that will arise when the sixth uh, seal is opened, when actually it is coming to its culmination, John asked for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Who shall be able to stand? And this question, is answered in the next chapter to, uh, to give an answer that which kind of generation shall be able to, um, um, to, to which we shall be able to stand. And so in the next chapter, we are told uh, who shall be able to stand. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. Uh, and I saw another angel sending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed our servants, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their four heads. And so the, four, the, 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 the final generation is having the seal of the father in their forehead. And we don't need to gaze about what this seal is all about. When you go to Revelation chapter 14, you get that, uh, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written in their forehead. And so this final generation is having the father's name written in their forehead. It's having the father's name written in their forehead. But then uh, in Revelation, again in Revelation chapter 3, uh, we find in Revelation chapter 3, and uh, this is uh, verses uh, 12. Who are these that are going to have the Father's name on their forehead? Who are these, the servants of God in Revelation chapter 7 and in Revelation chapter 14, having the Father's name in their forehead? We are told, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I'll write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I'll write upon him my new name. And so we find that these servants of God are the ones that are standing on Mount Zion with 
uh, the lamb and they're having the father's name on their forehead. And also they're having the new name of Jesus Christ. They're having the new name. He says that uh, I'll write upon them my new name. But what is this in the forehead again? We ask ourselves, because the last generation have to be in the most holy place. What is this in their forehead? In the book of Exodus, what is in the forehead? We ask ourselves, when we talk about uh, uh, what is in their forehead. In Exodus chapter 28, there is something that we see in it that uh, the high priest wore something on his head. And this is what we are told in Exodus chapter 28, verse 36. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it like the engravings of a sickness, holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace. And this represented the commandments of God that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be, and it shall be upon Aaron's forehead. And so on the forehead of the last generation, we find that it is inscripted holiness to the Lord. In that their frontal lobe is sealed and it has settled in truth, both spiritually and intellectually, that it cannot be moved. And then the last struggle will come upon the earth. And so we are living in a time when we are seeing that the winds are blowing on the four corners of uh, the earth. And uh, God is raising a people, a people who shall be sanctified in their life so that they may stand and be counted upon and be used by God to sound the loud cry. And we are told as we near the end, darkness shall cover the earth. In the book of Isaiah chapter 60, arise and shine for the light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and the gross darkness the people but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And so the greater the darkness, the greater the light of the final generation that shall be shining upon, shall be seen in the four corners of the world. Because in Daniel chapter 12, we are told that there shall be trouble as never has been. And if there shall be trouble as has never been, then you are looking at a people who shall have a faith that has never been to the magnitude of the trouble, so the magnitude of the faith is needed. And this is the time that uh, the Lord is um, uh, just having his last jury to stand as witnesses. And we are told that the gospel shall go forth as a witness in which way that in their life, they shall be able to shine and to show forth what God has done in their life. We see again that um, in the book of Revelation chapter 18, we are told, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. Uh, and this is in the point that actually the loud cry is going on. This is the point that um, uh, uh, we find that uh, Sister White refers in uh, Last Day Events, page 179, paragraph 2, that the great issue so near at hand, enforcement of Sunday laws will weed out those whom God has not appointed and will have a pure, true sanctified ministry prepared for the latter rain. It will be that time of a shaking it will be that time of uh, separating the chaff from the wheat and the tares um, and separating the goats from the sheep. And so we are looking at a point where actually we ha can have a whole wheat church. Sometimes people say that um, uh, uh, there shall be tares and wheat in the church until the end, but until the end of what? Christ says that the end is the harvest. And when the harvest starts, 
uh, actually it is the work of God separating the, the, the tears from the wheat. And so in this synopsis of um, the last generation, we are seeing that uh, God must have a people who will uh, reflect the image of Christ, the people who will really reflect the image of Christ. And talking about the art being lightened with his glory, in uh, Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, verses um, uh, 10, this is what we read, that for this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord, I'll put my laws into their minds and I'll write them in their hearts and I'll be to them a God and they shall be to me a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest in which way the glory of the Lord shall cover the whole earth and what glory is that? The character of God perfectly reproduced in his people. The character of God reproduced perfectly in his people. Now, on this issue of the last generation, as just we continue with this synopsis, we find that uh, this is uh, the generation that Christ talks about also in the book of Malachi, the book of Malachi chapter three, and uh, this generation we are told, and he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of the old and as in the former years. So there shall be a refining and a purifying so that a remnant stands out and a remnant is a piece of cloth from the original. So when the remnant is put together with the original, they shall match perfectly. And so Christ is in the most holy place and what is he doing for his church? What is he doing for his church? Because we find that he shall make a covenant with them. In Ezekiel, in the book of uh, Ezekiel chapter 11, from verse 19, we read that, um, and I'll give them one heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. And I'll take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I'll be their God. And so uh, this is the generation that shall be purified from uh, it is idols and be cleansed and the stony heart put away and given the heart of flesh because they are in the most holy place God does not require anything less from them, but a perfect reproduction of his character. And they will look in the mirror, which is the holy law, and looking unto Christ, they shall be able to reproduce the same character by the grace of God. And so uh, we have no excuse, people who are living in the end time, to remain ignorant of the issues at stake and what this generation is needed to be. Um, uh, in, in, the, in the book of um, Genesis chapter three, the fulfillment, the fully fulfillment of uh, verse 16. And to the woman, he said, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring um, forth children and they, thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. But again, when you back up in verse 15, he says, and I'll put an enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise the head and thou shall bruise his head. And so the culmination of this prophecy is not just by bruising the head of the serpent, but actually crushing the head of the serpent. 
And how is the head of the serpent crushed? How is the head of the serpent crushed? The head of the serpent is crushed on the day of atonement. It is only crushed in the day of atonement and in the final phase of it. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, um, in the book of uh, Leviticus chapter 16, um, we are told in verses 20 and 21, verses 20 and 21, just highlight it. And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live God and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the God and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And it is the sins of the people confessed on this live God that will send him in the wilderness. And so nothing else is expected on the day of atonement except the people living in that generation to hand over their sins to the high priest so that he may be able to place it on the head of the serpent and send it into in the wilderness never again to come back to the camp of Israel. The question now we should be asking, the question that I and you should be asking, will we rise up to the call of the final generation to stand as the last jury and to stand as the last witness that we have found nothing good in Satan and all our allegiance is with Christ? Will we by faith enter into the most holy place and have a demonstration of the father's character revealed in obedience to all his um, actually uh, a holy law that is in the most holy place? In the, in the book TM, page 91, uh, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, as we try to bring in the last points, the message of justification by faith. We are just looking at the synopsis of uh, the last generation. What is expected of this generation? The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Elder Swagon and Jonas. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the afflicted savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety, it invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given un into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in large measure. 92 says, the uplifted, uplifted savior is to appear in his efficacious work as the lamb slain, sitting upon the throne. Now, we only think about sitting on the throne in heavenly places. But first of all, Christ must sit at the throne of heart and direct every decision that the humans may make. We should come to a point that we may say, as Jesus Christ say, I come not to do my will, but to do thy will. It is written in the volume of books. And he says that... Uh, the righteousness that is in him is not of his own, but it is the righteousness of his father. And so Christ must be uplifted by this generation and they must um, 
allow Christ to sit upon the throne of the heart to dispense the priceless covenant blessings. Now, we just read about the covenant that he will write his law in our hearts. And when his law is written in our hearts, then the offerings of Judah shall be righteousness as it was in the old. And unto the forehead, because they shall be having the father's name in their forehead, it shall be written holiness unto the Lord. The benefit he died to purchase for every soul who should believe in him, that is the covenant blessings. John could not express that love in words. It was so deep. It was too deep, too broad. He calls upon the human family to behold it. Christ is pleading for the church in the heavenly courts above, pleading for those whom he paid the redemption price of his own blood. Centuries, ages can never diminish the efficacy of his atoning sacrifice. The message of the gospel of his grace was to be given to the church in clear and distinct lines that the world should no longer say the seventh day Adventists talk the law, the law, but do not teach or believe uh, uh, Christ. And so we are allowed to allow Christ to work out his salvation in us. We are to surrender everything that we have to surrender. We have to fight this final battle, the battle against the beast, his image, and his mark. Now, in this final generation where actually they are living in the final atonement and living in the final intercession, we are saying that they have to have victory over every known sin and they have to reproduce or reflect the law of God perfectly. And they have to go forth in the world as a witness of what the gospel can do in a believer. In the book of Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, we read, Wherefore, seeing we also are combust about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. They have been a lot of witnesses that have gone before us. But remember one thing that uh, these people never live in a so momentous time as we are living in. Some of them lived in the camp, some of them lived in the courtyard, and some of them lived in the holy place. But the final generation is that generation that lives in the most holy place. And the reason they live in the most holy place is to reproduce the character of God uh, perfectly. There are things which are allowed in the camp. There are things which are allowed in the holy place, but they are not permitted to enter into the most holy uh, place. And so it is, behooves us, those who are living in the last apartment of the sanctuary service as the last generation to understand why we are called to live in a such a time as this and why we are called to live in the last apartment of the, uh, of the sanctuary service. Without knowing why we are living in the time that we are living in and in the apartment that we are living in, we shall not be able to occupy the position that God would want us to occupy in this last minute of the earth's history. And so he bids us to come so that he may purify, we may reason with him, we may be able to be accomplished in him, we may be able to be complete in him. And so we are told that um, we are combust with a cloud of witnesses. In Hebrews chapter 11, we are told that cloud of witnesses. So we are told, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Doing what? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your hands. Ye have not yet resisted in unto blood striving against sin. And so we are coming at the point of 
the human history where we, ha we shall have to resist sin and to blood. We shall have to resist and to blood. And this final generation in the book of Revelation chapter 12, uh, uh, we are told in the book of uh, Revelation chapter, mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 12, this is uh, what we find in uh, verses uh, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. And so we have been told, ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. And the final generation, this is the generation that overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. In that, this is the generation that will consider death to be something pleasant than to sin against the most high uh, God. In the book of Hebrews chapter six, in the book of Hebrews chapter six, again, we are told, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go unto per perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal ju uh, judgment. And this we will, will, and this will we do if God permit. And so, this is a generation that is being called unto perfection. All other generation had a time to live, as I said, in the camp, in the, whole, in the courtyard, and in the holy place. But Paul is telling us, let us leave these apartments and go into the perfection, which is the most holy place, as you find it in Hebrews chapter 9. And um, uh, we are told, let us go unto perfection. And when this perfection is reproduced in us, the book of Hebrews chapter 10 says something wonderful. The book of Hebrews chapter 10, um, verses uh, 18, it says, now where the mission of this is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So this is the generation that will bring out Jesus Christ from the most holy place because if there is no more offering of sin, then it means that uh, the work of the high priest comes to an end because all sins have been forgiven and they have been blotted out of the sanctuary. Talking about where now where the mission of this is there is no more offering for sin, which means that the people have been purified in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 25, I presume. Uh, let me just do this in the book of uh, Jeremiah. We are told that um, we are told that um, the iniquities that is um, the, in, the the sins of Judah shall be sought for and uh, they shall not be found. Sorry for that. The book of Jeremiah. Uh, let me see. Jeremiah chapter 50, verses 20, uh, we saw that this is the generation that is to bring Jesus Christ out of the most holy place in that uh, there shall be no more offering for sin because their sins could have been remitted and then blotted out and the high priest will have no more work to do because they shall not be the sins of his people going in the sanctuary once again. In Jeremiah 50, 20, in those days and in that time, said the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I'll pardon them whom I reserve. So 
the sins of the people of God shall be looked for in the sanctuary, but because they had been remitted and they, they are blotted out, then the success of the sanctuary shall come to an end and Christ shall come to claim them as his own. Christ shall come to claim them as his own. Now, going back where we started in Revelation chapter 14, the last generation, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him and 140 and 4,000 having his father's name written in their forehead. This is what Christ is waiting, a manifestation of himself in his church. And when the church uh, actually reaches to this point, he shall come to claim them as his own. And how do they just look like when actually uh, um, uh, um, uh, they, uh, they are reflecting his character? In Revelation chapter 14, going down, we are told, here is the patient of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and of the faith of Jesus. And then after looking and seeing these people, first of all, on Mount Zion, having the Father's name on their forehead, they are seen actually keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus. We can say that everyone that will be in heaven actually kept the commandment of God. But um, actually the experience that the people in the camp, in the courtyard and in the holy place had is not the experience of the final generation. It is a whole different, even though they kept the commandments, actually we are told that uh, 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 we need to be perfected so that um, we may join them. And this perfection is really reproducing the character of God. And uh, uh, in verse 14, and I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time is come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So this harvest has to ripen. And then the one who is really putting in the sickle is like the cloud. One sat like the son of man and had a golden crown, which means that he was pure. And these people have to be pure. And so we are looking at a people living in the end time and having the seal of God, which is the father's name in their forehead, the perfect character of their father. And how are they living? They are living in the sight of a holy God sustained by his grace. And he keeps them from the hour of the trial that is coming. Lastly, in the book of uh, Daniel chapter 7, these people living at the end of the time, we are told that uh, because they are living just at the final end of everything. In Daniel chapter 7, verse um, 25, during the time of the little horn, we are told, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it into the end, unto the end. This is the power of this beast being taken away when the judgment is set. But as it is being taken away in verse 27, we are told, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Now think about that for a moment, that uh, this kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. For it to be an everlasting kingdom, then it have to be standing on the everlasting gospel. It has to be standing on the everlasting gospel. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having what? The everlasting gospel. So the everlasting kingdom is made of 
the everlasting gospel. And this is the gospel that has to produce the harvest. It is the gospel that has to ripen the harvest. And so what can we learn from the synopsis of the final generation? That uh, we, 6,000 years ago, the father and the son realized that the devil is a liar and he was cast out of heaven and cast on this earth. 2,000 years ago at Calvary, the angels who never understood the issues at stake came to understand and they rejected, they disconnected every sympathy they had with Satan. And now we are waiting for the final moment where now the inhabitants of this earth will say no to the evil one, to the devil, to the adversary and the confederacy of all evil and say they have nothing to do with Satan. As we look in the church and as we look in the world, there is still elements of entertaining sin amongst the people who are saying that they are waiting for the Lord. But then soon, no one knows how soon, God will have a number made up that will reject the sentiments of Satan and then they'll go about to do a final work, a work that has never been done before, a work of sending the scapegoat into the wilderness, never again to return in the camp by giving their sins to Jesus Christ and being able to live perfectly in the sight of God by his grace. And so I'll encourage us that um, although there may seem no light down the tunnel, God has promised that he will have this generation. The 144 standing on Mount Zion with the father's name on their forehead. The issue is not to worry about what is the number and all that stuff. The issue is for you and me to ask myself, will I be able to stand? Because the question is asked to this generation, for the great day of the wrath of God has come and who shall be able to stand? And God is counting on you and me to be found standing and not to be found falling. We cannot stand while we are still falling. We can only stand and never fall if we are in Christ. And so I'll encourage us with this last verse in the book of Philippians. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, verses um, uh, 9, as we bring this to a close, we are told by Paul, yeah, doubtless, and I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but done that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith. This is what we want to be found with the righteousness which is God by faith obtained through the faith of Christ. And I know everyone is praying that he may be part of uh, this company. And so may the Lord help us as we go through this series that we shall understand what God is calling us. And we shall understand what it means to have victory over sin and be able to be a ministry that can sound the loud cry. Otherwise, may the Lord bless us and keep us as we shall continue hearing this and listening to the Lord speak unto us that um, the word of God shall find an end in our hearts and remove every, uh, uh, um, every spot, every particle of defilement so that we may serve our living God in righteousness, in his righteousness, in holiness, and in pureness of life. And so may the Lord bless us, shall we pray. Our Father, we sit in heaven, 
thank you that uh, you are calling us in, into sacred nearness with thee, Lord. You are calling us to enter into thy own presence with boldness that you may be able to speak to us and through us. And Father, we may be your channels of disseminating light unto the world that is filled with darkness. And so praise be unto your name, Lord, you have called us not to be lost, but to be saved. And we believe that uh, you are in the business of uh, gathering your children who shall be heirs to the kingdom. We pray that uh, we may be perfected in righteousness, that Lord, we may not be found wanting in the balances of the sanctuary. And so continue being with us in the name of the son, Jesus Christ. Amen.